trade wars, bankruptcies, coronavirus, weather disasters, and low commodity prices. Each one of these adds another burden on the shoulders of America's farmers and ranchers. And it's a heavy weight that many times producers carry alone in silence. Tonight, we discuss an issue that's far too important to leave in the dark, mental health in rural America. Good evening and welcome to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight, we engage in an important conversation with a number of leaders from the ag community on the importance of removing the stigma surrounding mental health in rural America. And joining us tonight for our first round of discussion is American Farm Bureau Federation President Zippy Duvall. We also welcome National Farmers Union President Rob LaRue by phone and Farm Credit Council President Todd Van Hoos joins us as well. Thank you all so much for joining us. Let's start with you, President Duvall. Farmers and ranchers are clearly dealing with more stress and anxiety these days, but many weren't in a great financial situation before the pandemic. Can you paint the picture of what farmers are going through right now? Yeah, in uh, rural America with our farmers and ranchers, it is, uh, it is a very difficult time. Our farmers and ranchers uh, are experiencing what we describe as a perfect storm. Uh, we had trade wars. Uh, we had depressed commodity prices going into trade wars. Uh, we've had extreme weather all over the country from volcanoes to fires to too much rain to too little rain to hurricanes. Uh, They've been all across our country. We've had bad markets, uh, with, uh, and, and it's been very difficult. And then, of course, this year, the pandemic hit and really uh, stressed our food chain and caused a lot of uh, more problems for our farmers across America. So it's been a very difficult time, and uh, we're, we're praying for better days ahead of us. And a, a lot of the policy work that we're doing uh, is, is helping our farmers to actually survive. It is a lifeline. Some of the programs that this president, this administration has put out has been a lifeline to our farmers. Absolutely. And we're hoping that we're going to continue to see that as we move forward and get this next bill signed. President Duvall, how important is it to our farmers and ranchers to talk about what they're going through right now? Well, naturally, farming is kind of a lonely, lonely uh, industry. A lot of our farmers are just naturally in their business disconnected for, to the general public. And the only people they have around them is just their family or uh, two or three workers that they may have working for them. And, you know, a lot, most of the time our workers are more family members than they are uh, workers because they work so close to us, they become uh, thought of just like family. And, uh, and it's, so it's very hard for a farmer to uh, have, find somebody that they can share with when they're going through stressful time. And of course, you know, you don't want to go in the house with it and share it with your wife. She's dealing with children and all the stresses that go around raising a family. So it's just naturally a difficult thing for our farmers to do, you know, and then it's not our nature to share our problems. We're, we're farmers, we're tough. You know, we're the last one to go to the doctor even when we're hurt and sick. Uh, we, we just don't show a weakness. Uh, but I'd like to share a story to, to help farmers better understand it, because I felt all those pressures, the stigma, not talking about what I'm going through. But early this year, my wife passed away. And actually today, uh, August the 12th, is um, my wife and I's 41st anniversary. So it's a very emotional day for me today. But when she passed away, she was my best friend. Uh, she was my partner uh, in, on the farm and uh, in raising a family and in our Farm Bureau life. She was everything to me. My life uh, but just got turned upside down. And yes, like most farmers, most men, I said, I can handle this. I bottled it up inside. And one day, Christina, when a reporter was, uh, re, uh, re, uh, uh, was talking to me, I, for some reason, opened up to him and started sharing things about Bonnie and her life and what she meant to me and how God worked through both of us to touch other people. And it took so much pressure off of me. I, I can't describe how good it felt being able to talk about her and what a wonderful person she was. So I kind of say the same thing about stress when it comes to financial issues, being able to pass your farm on to the next generation. 
all those things that our farmers are expressed. If we can just find a friend or a pastor or or just some stranger like I found that day and sit down and talk to him and just talk about it. It's it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to to not to be okay and not talk about it. We have to find someone we can share it with to release that pressure that we're under. Absolutely. And, and we thank you for your courage, for your strength in sharing that story with us. And you're both continuing to do God's work just by being here tonight, setting that example for farmers and ranchers all across the country. President LaRue, what are you hearing from producers and why do you feel like it's important for them to open up about it? Yeah, I appreciate you having this conversation tonight, uh, Christina, because this conversation is actually part of what Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, and many other organizations have been doing for a while, and that is trying to continue to engage in the conversation, uh, remove the stigma, make sure that folks understand uh, just how important it is, uh, as has been mentioned before, to actually talk about the challenges, talk about the problems that they're facing. Uh, for Farmers Union, this has been work, obviously, that we've been doing for decades, since the 80s crisis. And although I continue to hear people say, we're not, this isn't a crisis like the 80s, I don't think it has to be a crisis like the 80s. If you are a young producer who's struggling, trying to figure out on top of all the uh, challenges that you would normally have, dealing with all the low prices and trying to manage debt. If you are a more seasoned farmer and you have been weathering a lot of storms, um, but at this point, you've eaten through your equity, and you're wondering, are you going to be able to carry this farm on to the next generation? So really a big focus for us is working through our partners uh, and with the important support for farm credit, uh, being able to train a lot of uh, our members to go back into those communities, really engage folks, uh, work with uh, community leaders, including the churches, to have these conversations, talk about it, remove that stigma, and to understand that much of the stress that folks are facing right now is beyond anything that any one person should have to manage alone and then connecting them to service. Yeah, you know, we've had a lot of time to look back at the farm crisis of the 80s, and we don't know what the long-term economic ramifications are going to be of this pandemic just yet. So we're still standing by to find out what's going to happen. President Van Hoos, you're familiar, though, with the financial state of the industry. How tough is it for farmers to financially plan for the future right now? And how is that playing into their mental health? Well, it's very stressful, and, and we see that every day. I mean, you think about the normal cycle of, of agriculture and finance, that you, you go through a season, you get to the end of the season, you see how things went, and then you start immediately prepping for the future. As farmers come through this year, uh, you know, when they look into 2021 especially, it, it's virtually impossible to predict that you're going to be able to make a profit, and, and that just increases the stress on you. I mean, I thought Zippy said it perfectly, you know, uh, bad prices coupled with trade wars, coupled, coupled with uh, unprecedented weather, and now hit with a supply chain disruption. I mean, you think of all of these things on top of each other, and then when a farmer looks forward and says, what am I going to do next year, and puts a pencil to it, and can't find a way to pencil in a profit, and, and just imagine the stress that that creates. And that's that's one of the important things we're talking about here is, Let's let's get that out in the open. Let's talk about it, because as as Rob said, um, you, you know, a lot of people are saying this isn't like the '80s, and and that's true. But if it's your farm and if it's your stress, it's a crisis, and and so these individual situations need to be explored and talked about and handled in a way that gets people the help they need. And I love how the three of you, the organizations that you serve, have worked together about the Rural Resilience Training Program. So let's find out more about that. President Van Hoos, tell us about that Rural Resilience Training Program and how it can help our farmers. Well, a couple of great thank yous, first of all. I mean, th this program would not have been possible without Cooperative Extension. They're the experts, they, they develop the program and then the willingness of, of the two national farm organizations, Farm Bureau and Farmers Union, to really take this on and, and, and do it with their membership and train people to go out in those communities is what's making it work. You know, we, we saw this building everywhere I traveled around in the farm credit system. 
I, I got reports from people on the front lines talking about, boy, there's, there's a lot of stress out there. And, and we saw it in our own employees, because if you're dealing with stressed people all the time, you get stressed yourself. And what we realized was there really wasn't much in the way of rural health, mental, uh, mental health resources out there for rural communities and farmers. And so we started looking around to see if there was something we could do to make a difference and came up and partnered with the Cooperative Extension Service at Michigan State and, and started to move this forward. And, and when, we, when we rolled out the, the program earlier this year and had such successful training at both the Farmers Union and the Farm, and the Farm Bureau, that told us we were on the right track. And then now earlier this year, we've made this training available for free to anybody who wants to do it, again, through the Cooperative Extension Service. And in the coming, just this week, we announced that Farm Credit throughout the country is making it available to all of its employees. Because one of the things that, that I think Zippy hit on exactly right is nobody talks about this. And nobody stands up their hand and says, hey, I need help. And we need people to do that. So this training will help people recognize the symptoms of stress uh, and, and mental health stress and provide them with some of the tools and resources to get people the help they might need. It's so important, and it's so important to ask for help as well. We are going to talk about that in our next block. But first, President LaRue, one of the greatest challenges in rural areas is a lack of access to mental health resources. President Van Hoos was just addressing it. What needs to change, though, so that farmers and other rural Americans can get the help they need when they need it? Yeah, it's a, it's a perfect question, Christina, because beyond the, the work to train individuals to recognize the signs, um, uh, of stress and to uh, learn how to connect people to resources, uh, we really need to step up the game in, in rural mental health care services um, and making sure that we have adequate care available uh, for folks. Um, that's been one of the challenges for rural health care uh, in general. Uh, we know of a lot of uh, situations where uh, access to care is very limited. And particularly with uh, rural mental health care, uh, over 60% of rural Americans live in areas with very deficient access uh, to mental health care services. So that presents a lot of challenges for how to uh, find services that we can get available out there and reach. And one of those things is building up the infrastructure. It's not just about getting practitioners and those uh, uh, experienced in providing uh, mental health services out there. Uh, we actually have a deficit of about 1,800 uh, of those workers. Uh, that will take time. But uh, more immediately, we have telehealth options, and that requires broadband. And one thing that we talk about repeatedly through a number of the challenges that may uh, face rural America is the need for adequate broadband. I would be with you by video tonight if we had uh, adequate rural broadband. And obviously, a TV show and a conversation like this is one thing, but being able to connect people to telemedicine and teleresources to uh, help them uh, through a crisis situation is critically important. That's available for other medical procedures, and uh, it's something that we really need to stress. So I really value the, the partnership, again, across a lot of farm organizations who continue to push for the need for rural health infrastructure that includes rural mental health. And uh, one key piece of that is making sure that we have adequate rural broadband access. I really love how the three of your organizations have come together to take this head on. You're all used to talking about ag policy and other issues that impact the ag industry, but talking about mental health, clearly a little bit different than what you're used to. But let's talk about how important rural stress is to each of your individual organizations. Let's start with you, President Duvall. Well, it's really important to us. You know, you look at farmers and we have all kind of tools on our farm. We have tractors and GPS and technology and, you know, all the things that we need to take care of our animals. But the most important tool on a farm is a healthy farmer. If we don't have healthy farmers, farmers, the farms and those tools will not work and will not produce. So it's important in that perspective. The other perspective is, you know, uh, our organization depends on a very healthy uh, uh, grassroots uh, member because all our policy comes from them. We need them making decisions with, with a sound mind and making good judgment, business decisions based on facts and, uh, and 
research that we know of and sound science. So we need them healthy to be able to make uh, our farms work and to make our organizations work. Now, there's, uh, there's, there are several things that we're doing in Farm Bureau to try to do that. We're trying to bring awareness through the Farm State of Mind website. Uh, we're also trying to educate uh, uh, through helping, uh, working with Todd and, and Farmers Union with the uh, Rural Resilience Program. And then, of course, in policy areas, we're trying to help in the policy area by, because you just, can you just think about how much stress it takes off of a farmer by having a good risk management program provided through the Farm Bill? So there are a lot of ways that we're working to try to help them. Yeah, we're sure grateful that you are. How about you, President LaRue? Talk about some of the ways that rural stress, why it's so important to your organization. Farmers Union's mission is to advocate for the economic and social well-being of family farmers and the rural communities. Clearly, mental health is an important part of that mission. I mean, if our members aren't doing well emotionally or if the communities aren't doing well, uh, they won't be able to do their jobs, and that, uh, re that has an impact on everyone. But these mental health issues also tie in pretty directly into the policy work that we do, whether it's on issues surrounding the farm economy or climate trade or climate change or trade. All these things, have, as we've talked about, add a tremendous amount of stress by contributing to uncertainty uh, and financial hardship. Uh, we have so many examples over the last several years um, and certainly over the last uh, few months with the pandemic of how that has a direct impact. So everything that we're doing on the policy side is trying to bring more predictability, stability, and certainty uh, along the way in that space. But even beyond the policy work, uh, within the organization itself, this training that is available and is now available widely is something that we continue to push and stress because it's not just about making sure that our policymakers are trying to do everything possible to build rural communities, but collectively, one of the things that uh, I love about rural America is that when they have tough times, they very instinctively come together uh, to build you know, strong communities wherever possible. Right now, it's about making sure that folks have access to the tools and to the resources available so that they can continue that work and help each other and help their neighbors uh, through these tough times. Very well said. And it's so great to know that organizations like yours are looking out for rural Americans on every level. President Van Hoos, your turn. Well, this is something we deal with every day. And, and unfortunately, we're dealing with more of it than we have in the, in the past. And, and I think, as Robin Zippy pointed out, you've you got to look at some of the underlying causes, right? I mean, farmers are reacting to the stress they get as a result of all these in, environmental factors that are impacting them, all these economic uh, problems that we're facing in agriculture. And so the important work of Farm Bureau and Farmers Union on the policy side to try to solve some of that is a big step. But in addition to that, you know, rolling out these programs, if, if somebody asked me what's the most important thing you're going to accomplish with this program, I would say to reduce the stigma. Because as, as we've seen over and over in rural America, people are reluctant to seek help. And even in those rare cases when, uh, when there is mental health available in the community, nobody wants to have their pickup parked out front of that, uh, that office, right? I mean, everybody sees that. And so there's just so much of this stigma. If we can help overcome that, I'll say we succeeded here today. Wow. You know, we always get to see your brilliant minds, but I think tonight our viewers had a chance to see a little bit more of each of your hearts. So thank you. So how do you start the conversation about mental health? Coming up, we're going to talk with a team of mental health professionals about the signs of stress that we should be looking for in our friends and loved ones. Stay with us. More Rural America Live right after this. Welcome back to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight we're talking about taking care of our mental health. And it's not an easy discussion, especially in the farming community. Our farmers are tough. They're used to solving problems on their own. But tonight we're going to discuss the importance of breaking down the stigma of asking for help. 
In just a moment, we'll be joined by a panel of three mental health professionals to talk about managing stress. But first, here's a look at the damage that can occur when problems are left bottled up for far too long. My dad, he was just Mr. Fix-It. He was thinking, I can fix a broken leg, I can sew a cow back up, like, I should be able to change this, I should be able to get through this, I'm, I'm stronger than this, I should be able to do it myself. There is so many people at his funeral, and so many people still say, I, I don't know why Rusty did it, and then you tell him, oh, he had depression. And, I mean, it's just like, oh, I didn't know that. My grandpa started the ranch. It was always an all-hands-on-deck uh, kind of operation, for sure. Typically, it was my dad, me, my mom, sisters, my little brother, fixing fence, gathering cattle, um, branding, all that kind of stuff. Go, throw, let go. Oh! Early to rise, late to bed. <laughs> Burning daylight, that's what they always said, burning daylight. My dad always lit up the room when he walked in. He was always the happiest guy, joking, laughing. If you needed anything, I mean, he would jump right on it. My dad was never too tough to say how much he loved us, um, and that was huge. You know, when you go to a nine to five job, if you're not the owner of the business, like you get to go home and you don't really have to worry about it. But when you're a rancher, you never really get to leave it. It is your identity. There's days you go fix fence, you're alone by yourself all day out in the sun. It definitely is isolated. You add on, we're in a drought. There's not a lot of grass. We're hauling water to our cattle. The bank's calling for the loan payment. You know, all that struggle just adds up. Sometimes he would get real stressed and down. He didn't have that same smile, but he still had that, you know, everything's okay smile, it's gonna be okay smile. He never really let us see him struggling. That morning, um, my husband and I were going out there to help my dad move cows. We had heard a gunshot when we got there, but he was already gone. All I could say was no, no, no. I never would have imagined, you know, that 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 would have happened, that my dad would commit suicide. It's kind of like an awakening, like an opens your eyes that this can happen to anybody. It's heartbreaking, and it's exactly what we are trying to prevent tonight. Joining us now, we welcome our panel of mental health experts, professor and extension specialist at the University of Wisconsin, Dr. John Shutsky, Assistant Professor of Human Development and Family Studies at the University of Illinois. Dr. Courtney Cuthbertson joins us by phone. And Pennsylvania farmer and pastor, Nyla Kogan. Thank you so much for being here. It's such an important topic. Dr. Shutsky, let's start with you. You've been a leader in the discussion of improving mental health in the ag industry. Let's start with some of the lifestyle changes that can help farmers and ranchers manage or reduce stress? Is there one main change that they can make? Christina, first of all, thank you for having me um, here from Wisconsin. And um, let me actually just cover two things really quickly. Having just listened to that last spot, it's really critical that people get help, uh, that you ask for help, whether that's from your doctor, from a, from a counselor, from a family member, uh, you you do need to be able to reach out and and get the support that's out there. Um, I do a lot of work, as you mentioned, in farm stress. Um, realize that that so many of the things that happen that end up leading to suicide really start with uh, basic mental health and also with stress management. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about with farm stress. One of the things that makes this industry so very stressful is the issue of control. We know that the things are, that are the most stressful to us are the things that we tend to not have any control over. And it's really obvious in farming. You've got weather, you've got markets, you've got 
the uncertainty with the elections and policy. And there just are a lot of things that are swirling around that create a lot of confusion. And it, it lends us to losing that sense of control that's just really so important as we kind of work to move forward in this industry. I tell people something that's it's kind of simple, but it's something that we fail to do during really busy times. And that's the simple, the, the simple um, task of spending, I would say, an hour maybe 90 minutes a week. You could either do it at one setting or over the course of a couple days, um, doing some planning, doing some really basic planning for the upcoming week. Um, it might be after church. It might be on Monday morning when you're eating breakfast and you're kind of getting ready, ready for a really busy work week. But I do this myself. You know, you pull out a notebook and a piece of paper and a pen and you write down some things that you want to try to get done during the course of that week. It could be goals. They might be jobs or tasks that you want to get started. It's really hard sometimes to get things started. It might also be family activities. Right now with the school year just around the corner or actually started in some parts of the country, overlaid with COVID, you know, there's just a lot of things to keep track of. And that physical act of taking a pen and a piece of paper and writing things down gives our brain and it gives our, our, our mind a little bit of a break. It gets things onto paper. That helps to alleviate some of those feelings that were out of control. And by the way, you don't have to have perfect control, but just doing a few simple things like that. Again, we tend to get so busy that we don't take that extra time to just do that extra bit of planning. So that would be one. It sounds overly simplistic, but it's one definite thing that we know can make a difference. Absolutely. And we look forward to unpacking what else we can do. But that is a great jumping off point. Thank you so much. Now, Dr. Cuthbertson, you worked on the Rural Resilience Training Program. What is the biggest hurdle to starting a conversation with somebody about their mental health? And how does the training help? First for the course with the team led by Michigan State University Extension. And I think there are a few things that might serve as hurdles to starting a conversation with someone about their mental health. One thing is that you may notice that someone else is having a really hard time but not know how to say anything, and I think that's one of the biggest hurdles. Should I say something? Would they get mad at me? What would I even say if they're asking if they're having a hard – if I ask if they have a hard time and they say yes, what do I do? Um, I think one of the second barriers that exists is the stigma around mental health. Um, so what I mean by this is the kind of negative perceptions that exist that might – make it difficult for someone who's experiencing difficulties with their mental health to ask for help. But even before that, stigma around mental health issues might also make it difficult for someone to recognize when they're experiencing chronic stress or when they're experiencing mental health issues. Oftentimes, people might be harshly criticizing themselves, thinking they're not getting enough done or they're being lazy or they're being ineffective, when actually they're experiencing very high amounts of stress and could benefit from having more support. So stigma might make the person feel like they just need to be stronger or do better or get with it rather than seeing themselves with more compassion and realizing that there are people out there who do want to help to provide that support that they need. So the Rural Resilience Training Course helps with uh, both of these things as it includes three different sections. The first focuses on managing stress, including what those signs and symptoms are of stress, as well as the effects that they have. It includes strategies for managing stress common stressors among farmers and ranchers, as well as ripple effects of stress in farm families, because we know um, even if one member of the family is the primary operator of a farm, it's not just that person who's impacted by that stress. The second section of the class or the course online focuses on communication, including how to engage with empathy, how to manage conflict, skills for interaction, things like active listening skills. And that third and final section of the online course focuses on understanding what risk factors of suicide may look or sound like and how to provide that initial assistance to someone who's showing signs of suicidal thoughts. So the course really helps by leading participants through how to say something to someone that you might be concerned about, as well as improving knowledge about signs of stress and how to reach out for that help. Okay, really important information there. We want to bring in Pastor Kogan now. Thank you so much for joining us as well, because we all know how important faith is in meeting the challenges that life can unpack on us sometimes. Talk about the role of faith in coping with this crisis and how our faith leaders can really make a difference. Thank you, Christina. It's a pleasure to be with you. 
Um, I hear from many of my congregants over the years that they are amazed how faith helps them through rough times. And they ask me, how can people who do not have faith get through a crisis? Psalm 23 tells us that even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil for God is with us. And the important word there is through. God will get us through those valleys. He will not just leave us down in that valley, but get us through where we need to go to be in a better place. I think it's important, especially in this day and age with so much stress and everything going on in our lives to be part of a faith community. A church is a family in itself, a support group. And it helps when times are tough to have that extra help, to have that extra support. Faith leaders, pastors, when they stand in front of church, do hopefully exactly what I do. When I'm in front of my congregants on a Sunday morning, I look around and see who's there, but more importantly, I also see who's not there. I do a visual roll call. And if an individual or family is missing for several weeks, I kind of mark it in the back of my mind. I need to go see them. I need to see if there's anything wrong or what's going on because it's unlike them to miss church. And in doing so, uh, we can keep better contact with each other and connect with each other better. But this time with coronavirus, it's even more difficult though at times to do that because um, people are isolating themselves and church is not going on the way it usually does. But the important thing is to have faith and stay connected with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ so important. It's For me, it's everything. Dr. Shutsky, how big of a problem is the stigma around stress and mental health in rural communities? What are you seeing and hearing out there right now? I think that regardless of what part of the country you're in, whether you're rural or urban, I, I think there has always been a stigma and continues to be a stigma around all of these issues, ranging from basic mental health, being able to talk about issues like depression, and especially when you begin to talk about suicide and suicide risk. Um, it has probably been uh, much more prevalent in our rural communities. I think part of it is because people are fiercely independent. Again, I was one of those people growing up in a small farming community in Northwest Indiana. And people just didn't want to talk about those kinds of issues that were viewed as very personal to their families. Um, and, and I think that that does continue. Have, having said that, I guess I, I would like to maybe just celebrate a little bit the fact that in the last even maybe two to three years, we really have changed uh, quite a bit. We are much more able to talk about these issues than we were, say, when I got back into this big time back in 2015 or 2016, I really do commend uh, RFD and Farm Bureau and Farmers Union and all of the groups out there that are working to get together because it's through that interaction, it's the partnerships that are happening. Um, ha again, having shows like this, having events at national conferences where you talk about mental health and stress management and suicide prevention, I really think it's making a difference. We, we need to continue, though, to talk about mental health the same way we do with physical health. If I have an issue with my heart or my digestive system, I have no trouble going in and talking to my family doctor. If I think I might be dealing with uh, depression or an underlying feeling of anxiety, or again, if I'm feeling suicidal, it's something that might be scary to talk about what's going on with your brain, but we need to think about it the same way we do as all other systems in our body. You know, my grandfather is was a rough and tumble rancher from Idaho. And this is a man who would not open up to anybody about his emotions. So let, let's talk about how we can start that conversation. Dr. Cuthbertson, we know that our farmers are independent. They're not likely to ask for help. But if we see someone in direct risk, what signs should we be looking for and what guidance do you have for us on how to open up a conversation with them? This is such an important question. The first thing that I think that you can do is to watch for changes in the person that you're concerned about. And I think that Pastor Kogan provided a, a very good example of this 
It could be differences in the kinds of things that they're doing or not doing. It could be differences in the way the person might be interacting with others. Maybe you notice that they're more irritable than usual, or they're not joking around as much, or maybe the person seems like they are withdrawn or fatigued or exhausted more than usual. So uh, you could observe any changes that seem to be in the way the person's interacting with other people. You could also observe any changes in the way that the person is engaging in their work. So on a farm, are they using typical safety protocols? Are things as well-maintained as usual? Are chores and tasks being completed like normal? Or does it seem like things are piling up and maybe the farmstead's not as well-maintained as normal? Um, and that, that seems in misalignment with what you know the person cares about and, and how much care they have for, for their farm or their ranch. So family and friends can help someone that they care about by checking in and asking how they're doing. Um, you could even use I statements. I, hey, you know, I've noticed that you usually joke around a lot, and I really miss hearing your jokes. How are you doing? And just using those to observe what you have seen and use it as a way to open the conversation. And a really cre key critical component with this is make sure that you're listening to hear the response that the person gives rather than rushing to solutions. We are so often focused on, okay, how can I solve the problem? How can I make this better for the person? And sometimes taking that step to slow down and to listen is part of the solution. Um, so when we slow down and listen, the person might feel more like they're being heard. And the online course that uh, I, I mentioned briefly before does go through some of those active listening techniques. So those who are helping are better able to hear what a person is struggling with and be with them in that moment. And I would also highlight another thing that Pastor Kogan said to make sure that you stay connected. We know from research that social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors for suicide. So friends and family can help by staying connected and by keeping that person involved in social activities, certainly as it is safe to do so in our current context with COVID-19. And if being in person is not an option, you could reach out with a phone call or a text message to stay connected. And that's for someone who's not struggling with mental health, that might seem like a really little thing, but to someone who's struggling, that might feel like a really uh, big gesture and a really nice thing to keep that connection going. Um, another thing that might be really helpful is just starting conversations about mental health in general, maybe not about a particular person, um, but having these conversations in general helps to create it as more of a normal or typical topic of conversation rather than something that feels a little more awkward or uncomfortable. So, for example, you could start a conversation with someone about all of the things that you're hearing here on this program just to get a, the conversation going. You know, what's a really hard conversation to have in any arena is the conversation about suicide. It's a really tough topic, but we know the outcome that can impact families for generations. Pastor Kogan, if someone that we care about is considering taking their own life, how do we approach that situation? Many worry that asking them about it may push them over the edge. What advice do you have there? Yeah, you tend to want to just ignore it or hope it just goes away, but you have to face it head on. You have to go directly to that person and ask them, are you considering hurting yourself? Have you been contemplating suicide? Um, and ask them, have you thought how you'd want to do it to see how thought out they have taken this idea already to see how much help they need. And it's something that is di very difficult to do but it's something that is necessary to do. It is like having a splinter in your hand. You won't let it there and fester. You have to go and take the bulls by the horn, speaking as a farmer, and hit it directly. You know, Dr. Cuthbertson, you've actually done research in this field. What did you discover? Well, this is a really great question, and it's an important thing to cover. There are a lot of uh, misconceptions around asking directly about suicide. A lot of people do have this concern that you mentioned. If I ask about it, does that make someone more likely to attempt suicide? And what the research demonstrates is that is actually not true. Um, so research has shown that asking directly if someone is having thoughts of suicide is the best practice to use, and it does not make someone more likely to attempt suicide. Um, when a person is suicidal, they might feel like no one else understands them or realizes that they're struggling. 
And to ask the question directly may bring a sense of relief that someone has noticed, and it opens up the conversation so the person can feel heard. Something to keep in mind is if, if you are in a position of asking someone whether they are thinking of suicide, know that if they say yes, it is imperative to not leave that person alone and work with them to determine the best course of action, whether it is to call a healthcare provider for help or a counselor if they have one, a family member, maybe even going to the hospital. Um, so in, in summary, asking someone about suicide does not make them more likely to attempt. Okay. Well, I wish we had more time together because we could really talk about this for hours. I feel like we're all brazen enough to go there and it's an important enough topic to do so. But if our viewers were able to remember one thing from this show tonight, what would you like that to be? Dr. Shutsky, let's start with you. Just following up on the last part of our conversation here, there are a lot of resources Dr. Cuthbertson talked about the training programs she has been involved in uh, developing and delivering for people literally all over the country. We've worked together on some of those. Um, so search out that sort of uh, information, either from your extension service. The other thing I want to just talk about very briefly, so the suicide question is really difficult to talk about. We talk about asking the question and it's it's tough it's it it makes it we make it sound somewhat easy in this conversation but this is really tough stuff so i would encourage people to learn a little bit more about suicide prevention there are a couple of good programs i'm just going to throw these out there one of them is called qpr it's sort of like cpr but instead of dealing with your heart you're dealing with mental health and specifically suicide prevention. The other one's a little bit longer, a little bit more um, of a time commitment. It's called Mental Health First Aid. Both are also available online. So I would really encourage people out there in our farming and agricultural industry to seek out more information and learn as much as you can because you can save a life. That's, right. That's what it comes down to is saving lives. I'm really glad you said that. Now, Dr. Cuthbertson, what do you want our viewers to take away from tonight's program? I would say a couple of things. First, uh, know that asking for help is actually a sign of strength. It is so difficult and challenging to ask for help when someone feels like they need it. And recognizing that as a sign of strength rather than weakness could be really helpful um, to assisting someone to getting access to resources that could be helpful. The other thing I would say is if you're thinking about someone in your life that you're concerned about, know that saying something is better than saying nothing. Reach out to that person you're concerned about. You never know how something that might seem small to you, like sending a text message or calling to check in, could really make a big difference to someone else. And as Dr. Shutsky said, this could be a, a life-saving moment. Absolutely. And Pastor Kogan, what would you like to leave our viewers with tonight? I want farmers to realize that their identity is not strictly the farm that they're operating or the ranch they are more than that. They are a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife, a mother or a father. And most importantly, they are a child of God and their life matters. And for others to realize that, to see the signs that we talked about here tonight, to be willing to reach out and to give support and to be there for one another. That's right, and we have to look after all of God's children. Thank you so yes. much for joining us. Really appreciate all of you. Now, some of the strengths of rural America can make sharing problems a challenge with other family members. After the break, we're going to spend a little time with a farmer and author, Matt Rush. He'll explain how to bridge the generational divides and create healthier families. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Rural America Live. I'm Christina Loren. Tonight we're talking about a subject that is very difficult to share with others, stress. And caring for our mental health during times like this is more important than ever. But admitting that you need help is not easy to do. For some, the silence leads to an act of desperation. But the pain isn't taken away, it's transferred to our loved ones. We now have a message from a widow and farmer who lost her husband to suicide a year ago. 
Teresa Gilley is a soybean grower in Minnesota. Let's listen as she reflects on what she's learned over the last year. You need to start thinking about your mental wellness. You know, we talk about mental illness. I want you to think about mental wellness. You know, if your mind is clear and you're, um, and you're eating healthy food and you're getting some exercise, you're gonna reason well and you're gonna be able to figure things out. It's when, it's when those things get, aren't working right that you start having trouble. You have to start thinking about, you know, you need to treat your mental wellness just like you'd treat a cold or a heart condition or diabetes or a broken bone. You need, if you need help, you need to get help. And it's okay. I, I did it and I still, I'm lucky I still have friends and stuff I talk to all the time. And it's good for me. It's good for my mental wellness. And if you see somebody that's, work, that's struggling this spring, um, go help them. You know, that's what farmers do. And, you know, because we're so talented, you know, maybe the best thing you can do is you go help them, have them come and help you with something. Somebody that is, is feeling that they're not worth much, maybe if you give them that one reason to be, worth, to be, to be valued is worth it. So if I'm gonna ask you, this has been a long, painful journey for me, and I don't want anybody else to go through it. So if I asked you what was the most important thing in your life, I sure as heck hope you're not gonna tell me it's your tractor or the back 40. You're gonna tell me it's your family. So I want you to do this one thing for me. I want you to go home tonight. I want you to hug your spouse and give them a big kiss. Hug your children and tell them you love them. Your children are your most precious commodity. In this time of stress, I want you to enjoy the little things. Enjoy the simple things like a, a walk, a bonfire, playing games with your kids, or having dinner. You need to find your resilience now more than ever. And know tomorrow is another beginning. Thank you. And joining us now to continue our discussion is farmer and author Matt Rush to talk about how we can reduce the stress in our lives and prevent a situation like Teresa is going through. Now, Matt, you recently published Stress Free You. Let's start with what a stress switch is. Well, thank you so much, Christina. And what a powerful message that she had. And really and truly, as we talk about all of this, as we talk about stress and mental health, the one thing that we never really talk about is turning off the stress. And it's one of those things that we said was a stress switch is what you have allowed to come into your body, the stress you have allowed to happen to you. And most of us don't even know it's happening. I mean, there are thousands of stress switches that we have engaged a lot of times on a daily basis. And most people are completely unaware of them. I mean, we put 108 of them in the book that you can get on Amazon, but obviously not all 108 are going to apply to you. But a stress switch can be something as simple as, as watching the national news, there's nothing positive about that, or 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 being surrounded by negative people, or or being too tied to work when you should be focused on what's going on at home. So that that that's what the stress switches are, and and it's like you know those are the holes in the bottom of a boat, and we've got to start turning those switches off so that we can actually handle the stress that we know we're going to get. Because because let's be completely honest here. Stress is our body's natural response to danger. I mean, our body automatically switches from a natural state of rest, digest, and restore to the state of fight, flight, or freeze when we undergo stress. And it does, it just seems like we never have that moment of 
rest, digest, and restore anymore. And we live in a society and in a world where we we never turn it off. And and really, there's two types of stress. There's life stress and there's daily stress. Life stress are those things that we have no control over. And in agriculture, we certainly get that. We know what those things are. But the daily stress, we have 100% control over. And we need to start turning off some of that type of stress so that then we're actually capable of handling the the daily the life stress that we know we're going to face and we're going to get you know matt why is stress relief though not enough oh you know we and we talk a lot about stress relief but the thing about stress relief is it's just not enough it's like trying to to drain a cell phone battery while it's still plugged in so you've got to start turning off some of the stress that you can actually handle so that then those things aren't just temporary and they actually would be beneficial to you, not just a little Band-Aid on, on, on it. Absolutely. Now, we're going to give you the last word in this program. What one piece of advice would you like our viewers to remember? Oh, um, the one piece of advice that I would like for everyone to remember is that there's hope. Um, you know, agriculture and her people, we've always been resilient. We've always handled the ups and the downs, maybe with an ounce of doubt, but never with a second guess that what we do is exactly what God himself intended for us to do. And, and, and we believe that that's true down to our core. But, but the reality is we're going to have down days and we're going to have stress. We're going to have life stress. We're going to have daily stresses. And we've got to be able to take control of those so that we can handle them. A lot of times people will even say, well, isn't a little stress good? And I'm like, well, what's better, a small black widow spider in your bed or a big black widow spider in your bed? No, no stress is good. And, and when we experience that life stress that we're all going to experience, we're going to have some type of a go-to, something that's going to numb the pain or ease the pain. And then I would ask the question, is it a healthy go-to or is it an unhealthy go-to? Because a lot of times we go to the unhealthy things to cover it up and try, try to, to put a Band-Aid over the, the, the stress. When if we start switching off what we can switch off, dealing with what we can deal with, and it's about doing less, not more. It's about doing less with bigger results. When we can do that, then the resiliency of agriculture and her people, that's when it comes to the top. That's when we can see the good, the positive, and the pure. Because you were born to live a life of love, joy, peace, and a sound mind. And agriculture provides that more than any other place. It also provides the challenges to that more than any other industry. So we encourage you to know that there's hope. Get healthy goes to and Turn off the stress. That's right. I want to read your book, Stress Free You, available you. on Amazon. Thank you so much, Matt Rush. When well, we thank, thank you, you for joining us for this very important discussion regarding mental health, we hope that the conversation will give you the tools and the courage to begin sharing challenges with your loved ones and your neighbors. If you know somebody who needs help, Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The number is 1-800-273-TALK. They're available 24-7. You can also learn more about stress and mental health by going to the American Farm Bureau's Farm State of Mind website. You can find that at farmstateofmind.org. Also, you can visit the National Farmers Union Farm Crisis Resource Center at farmcrisis.nfu.org and the Farm Credit Council's Rural Resilience page. That's farmcredit.com. You're not in this alone.